Hi, everyone. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Hera Vlamakis. I'm a group leader in the microbiome program here at the Broad, working with Romnick Xavier and Curtis Huttenhauer. Um, and I'm just going to give you a big overview on, on microbiome research in general today, how we do things, um, make sure that we're all on the same page as far as um, some of the terms that we use, and then I'll give you a few short stories of work that um, we've uh, been working on to show how we think the field is, is headed. Okay, so, so we have about as many microbial cells oh, in our bodies as, uh, as human cells. This says 38 uh, trillion in, in my computer. Um, and most of those bacteria are in our gastrointestinal tract. While our 30 trillion human genes have um, about 20, or uh, our 30 trillion human cells have about 20,000 genes um, that are encoded in them, in our microbial population, we have 8 million genes. So even though the cell numbers are about the same, the genetic potential of these microbes that are living in our bodies is humongous. Um, and there's a, up to 10,000 different species that can live in the gastrointestinal tract. And most of these bacteria are good for us, so they do a lot for our health. They're essential. Um, they help synthesize vitamins that we use. They uh, help to take up different carbohydrates. Well, wow, this is totally messed up here. Um, they help take up or break down carbohydrates from food that we eat, and they can prevent um, colonization by pathogens, uh, as well as help to train our immune systems. And sometimes those microbes... Um, can be associated with disease. So, so in particular, one of the diseases I'll focus on today is inflammatory bowel disease, uh, where we know that there are specific microbes that are enriched or depleted in this disease, and a, and a dysbiosis of the gut microbial community um, plays a big role in, in that disease. And so, like I said, just to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as terminology, I'm going to go over a few of the words that we use commonly. So microbiome, metagenome, and microbiota. Initially, the word microbiome was used to describe the collective genome of all of the bacteria that live um, in your body. And I, I say bacteria, I should say all of the microorganisms. So these could be eukaryotes as well. Uh, and the term microflora or microbiota was used to describe the microbial community, so the actual bacteria. And more recently, the word um, metagenome has, has been used um, to describe the collective genomes of a community, so all of the DNA. And, and what I'll be using today is, is this. So I'll say microbiota for the community of bacteria. I'll use metagenome to describe the total DNA for a, for a community, and I'll use the word microbiome to kind of encompass both of those. And so we have various big omics ways that we can um, do microbiome research. Basically, you start with your favorite sample. In, in the case of the gut, we use stool frequently. Um, you extract DNA. Then you can, you can look at which bacteria are, are present using 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing. So this is an amplification technique. You, can, um, you amplify a specific gene I'll go into in a moment. Um, it's great because it allows you to detect all of the um, community members, even the ones that are present at very low abundance. Uh, alternatively, you can look at total DNA and do metagenomic sequencing or whole genome sequencing. Um, this allows you to get all of the genes that are present. It doesn't just give you taxonomy, but you can actually start to look at function. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of these two methods. Um, also, we're looking at uh, RNA to see what genes are actually transcribed. So just because you have genes doesn't mean that you're actually expressing them. And as we start to look at different data types, we can uh, get a better idea of which bacteria are really um, contributing in a given environment at a given time. And finally, I should say that, that in order to study this community, we need to think about lots of things. I'm not going to go into too many details about other uh, omic methods, but this is uh, something that's ongoing in the field where we're looking at metabolomics, proteomics, viromics, culturomics. Um, basically trying to get as big a, and broad a picture of the environment that the bacteria are living in. 
Okay, so let's go into a little bit of detail on, on 16S gene sequencing. Um, this is the structural component of the prokaryotic ribosome. We use it to identify phylogeny. The reason why we can do that is because um, this gene is very highly conserved, even among all domains of life. So you can see in green here are colored um, the identical nucleotides, and homo sapiens are at the top, yeast, uh, corn, and then microbes of all, of all sorts. And, and you can see that there are very conserved regions in the sequence. Um, but the reason why this gene is useful is that those conserved regions span um, or flank very variable regions. So we can design PCR primers to amplify the variable regions, and then we can compare those variable regions to, to determine um, which microbes are present. This is great because you don't need to be able to culture the microbe. A lot, a lot of um, microorganisms are very hard to grow outside of their um, native environment. Um, it's a little bit tricky because there's more than one copy of the 16S gene in most microbial genomes. And so if you don't take into account how many copies of your 16S gene do you have, you can be um, a little bit fooled by microbial abundances. So, so you need to do some, some computational um, analysis to, or normalization to, to be able to really um, determine abundance of, of a given species um, or a given taxa. And, and using just the 16S um, ribosomal RNA gene, you're, you're actually a little bit limited in what level of um, taxonomic identification you can get. So it's very hard to get to actual species level identification. Most of the time you can only get to the genus level um, if you're lucky. And, it, and that's just because of the amount of sequence that we get. But when we have the sequence, you can, um, you can look at the data in different ways. So, so here I'm showing you, these are all of the reads uh, from a population, 16S genes that we have. Um, different colors denote different organisms. And so, so what we do is basically just count reads, and, and then you can group them based on organisms. So blue's got five reads, red has seven, et cetera, et cetera. We can determine the frequency, um, adjust for the, uh, the copy number of the 16S gene, like I mentioned, and then you can visualize using um, a heat map for the abundances. And you can use, um, so I say organism here, but that's really operational taxonomic unit, or OTU. Um, that's because frequently we can't determine a, a particular species. Like I said, we have many databases now of, um, of 16S ribosomal RNA genes, and we can compare our sequences to them to get the best or most similar um, taxonomic classification. So, so this is using 16S um, sequencing data. We can also classify microbes using the metagenomic um, profile, so all of the DNA in, in that community. And so one tool that we, that we use to do this is called Metaflan 2, which was um, developed with Curtis Huttenhauer's lab and Nicola Segata. Um, the way this works is if you look at all of the organisms on a, on a tree here, um, you can see that, that there are branches. We look for specific genes, so colored in red here, you could see this gene is only present on this clade. And so, so we're calling those marker genes because they tell us something about um, the phylogeny of, of the organism that they're coming from. And we know that if you have this gene, you're only present in this particular organism. This is based on reference genomes, right? So really, we rely on having um, a number of microbial reference genomes already sequenced, which there are many. Um, so doing that, then we could look at um, those available reference genomes. We get our marker genes. We have a database of those genes. Um, and then you can map your metagenomic reads to, to the database. And you can then assign um, taxonomy to, those, uh, to the organisms that are present. Uh, and, and in the end, you end up with something very similar to what I showed you previously. You have, in this case, we can get to the species level because we're re relying on men much more sequence um, coverage to be able to classify things, you can see what species are present and in each sample. So the, the columns here are samples. Um, the species in those samples are, are in each row, and, and the boxes are colored by their abundance. And so you can get heat maps like this to, um, to visualize your data. 
another way to, to look at whole metagenome um, sequencing data is, is using a reference-free method. So in this case, we're not using marker genes that are based on reference genomes, but rather we're using gene abundance. So we do the deep sequencing um, of, of all of the, the communities, and then you can take and make a non-redundant gene catalog. So you, you can cluster the genes um, based on their similarity, and, and then you can look and see in all of the samples that you have what's the abundance of each of these genes. Um, based on the abundances, we can cluster the, the genes by co-abundance, um, and then you end up with these groups, um, which we're calling metagenomic uh, species. And, and in each group, then, you have all of the genes that are present at a given abundance, so that this is assuming that your, if your genes are on the same chromosome, you'll have the same number of um, each of those genes. They group together. Um, and then you can use references to assign taxonomy. Again, we're we, we rely on taxonomy for that. But you can see how many um, of those clusters actually are not um, labeled by reference genomes. So, so here I'm showing you the number of, of species that are present in uh, all of these different samples. Each row is a sample. And um, colored in black are all of the, the clusters where the taxonomy is not known. So really, there's a huge amount of unknown space um, still in, in microbiome research because we rely on what's known in order to determine what's present. Um, but no matter which way you, you get your uh, taxonomic profile, you can then visualize it in different ways. So like I said, we can do heat maps where we count the reads or we assign taxonomy um, in the different ways I said. For, for each sample, we can get abundances of a different OTU. Um, and then we need to find ways to compare these. So we can look at heat maps, but another common way that, that we use to, to look at um, microbiome data is, is ordination plots. And so the way to think about these are they're a way to show multidimensional data in two-dimensional space, right? So just like we can visualize the different views of, of this motorcycle here, you can do the same thing with a microbial profile. So you could imagine if you have two microbes only present in a sample, you can very easily just plot the abundance of microbe one to microbe two for each of the samples, and you can see how similar they are to each other. When you've got three or more um, microbes that are present in the community, you need to go a step further, and you can use different distance uh, matrices to, to get a value for how similar are these samples to each other, and then you can plot those, um, those values here. And, and so you look at variation between samples, and the distance between the points um, on this uh, principal coordinate plot is, is reflecting a function of their similarity to each other. So when you look at a PCOA plot, the closer the dots are to each other, the more similar those samples are, and each dot encompasses an entire microbial community. So, so just to give you an example of that, um, with the Human Microbiome Project, this, this was uh, a study done uh, or published in 2012 where we looked at healthy individuals um, and we looked at, I say we, it wasn't me, um, but we looked at uh, healthy individuals and the microbial communities on different parts of their bodies. Uh, and if you look at those communities, you can see that, again, each dot here is a community. The closer together the dots are to each other, the more similar they are. If we color by body site, you could see that there are location-specific microbes. So that means that the microbes that are present in, in my mouth or someone else's mouth are more similar to each other than um, on my skin or in my nose, et cetera. Um, so, so depending on what side of the body you are, uh, a microbe is, they're, they're likely to be more similar um, to each other. Okay, and then there was a second phase of, of the Human Microbiome Project, which was more recently um, published. And, and while these data that I'm showing you here is based largely on 16S profiling, um, in the second phase, uh, we generated a lot more uh, metagenomic data. So this allows you to get more to the species level of which bacteria are present, and it also lets you get even deeper to the strain level. So you could look at single nucleotide polymorphisms um, to determine which, uh, uh, how those uh, members of each species is varying. So 
looking now at 2,500 metagenomes from seven different body sites, uh, you can look at a principal coordinate plot and, and see that very similar to what we saw with 16S data, body sites grouped together, so the stool samples are all clustering here. Um, these are all the oral samples. You could see they break down a little bit further with plaque or um, the buccal mucosa or tongue. Um, but in general, body sites, again, will group with each other. Uh, what's different is that we can actually see the different species now um, contributing to, the, to these differences. You could see the stool samples have all these species up at the top, um, which are not very present in any of the other body sites, and, and similar for all the oral sites, have a cluster of species that are, are very low abundance in other sites. And so then, looking at this, because we have different body sites, we can start to ask, like I said, strain level questions. Um, and so there's another tool called Strain Plan. This is just one of, of many options that are available. Um, where we looked at uh, variation in strains. And so once again, using those marker genes that I mentioned previously to, that we used to, to determine a, a given species, um, we, we can look at those marker genes, we can map our reads to those markers, and then we can look at um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? So, so for every particular um, marker, each sample has a certain sequence for the reads that are mapping, and you can see that there, there are different variations that group together. And then you can visualize this either um, on a phylogenetic tree, or you can make a principal coordinate plot to, to basically look at how similar are um, the strains from a given species between different samples. And so we could plot then looking at um, the distance between um, strains within uh, a given site, um, so, so how different are the strains in your mouth, for example, to each other compared to other body sites? Um, and you could see that there are some organisms, uh, like Streptococcus salivarius, where, um, that fall right on this line. So that means that the strains that you find in the mouth are as similar to the strains that you would find in, in, on the skin. Um, and you could see that here, the sam each, each dot is a sample that, that has a, this species in it. Um, and the samples are, are kind of all mixed together. And this is in contrast to, um, for example, Haemophilus parainfluenzae, where you could see that there are clusters that form when we look at, at, the, at each of the samples. And if we color by body site, you see that the clusters um, for the tongue dorsum are together, the clusters for um, the, the tonsils are together. So, so really, um, depending on where you are, even in the mouth, you have more phylogenetically similar strains, um, which I think is pretty cool that we were able to visualize that. Okay, so now I'm going to move a little bit away from um, the, all of the uh, body sites that I've been talking about, and I'm going to focus in on, on the gut. Um, so most of the bacteria, like I said previously, are in your gut, and depending on where you are in the GI tract, you can you have a different microbial load. The greatest load is by far is in the colon, where you have 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 12th um, microbes present. Um, the the bacteria vary depending on where you are, um, and in most of the studies that we do, we use stool as a proxy for um, gut microbes. And the reason we do this is because of ease of sampling. It's non-invasive. You can get a stool sample from pretty much anybody. Um, and you can sample over time. And, and I'll tell you a few stories um, in a minute where, where longitudinal sampling has made a big difference in our understanding of, of what's going on in a, in a given um, system. OK, so in the GI tract, this is, this is now HMP1 data looking at the healthy volunteers. You could see. Um, the relative abundance of each of these genera is, is, on, um, is on the y-axis, and that every, every sample, every individual, is a column here. Um, it's ordered based on Bacteroides, which is a very common um, genera in the, or genus in the, in the gut. Um, and you can see that there's a big variation in which bacteria are, are actually present in any healthy person's um, stool sample. But there's a balance there, and so no matter what your microbial community is, it's in some sort of balance with itself, and, and it reaches homeostasis, and, and for the most part, you're healthy. Um, the problem comes when you have 
uh, a dysbiosis. So there can be an expansion of some pathogen. Um, you could have reduced diversity, for example, due to antibiotic treatment. Um, or you could, for, for some reason, lose beneficial microbes. And then the, the shift changes, um, and, and these are the, the instances where we think that the microbial community in your gut could affect your health. Um, and there are certain diseases where the microbiome has been uh, implicated in disease um, onset and pathology, and, and the one that I'll focus on today is inflammatory bowel disease. Um, Crohn's disease is, is one of the major uh, subsets of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, one of the interesting things here in this graph that I like to point out is that um, Crohn's disease and many other um, immune disorders, the incidence has been increasing over time. And this, this increase in incidence is likely due to environmental factors, um, not genetic factors, because of just of the time scale that we're seeing such a large increase. And so focusing on inflammatory bowel diseases, like I said, Crohn's disease is, is one of the, the major diseases um, encompassed by this. Ulcerative colitis is the other uh, major disease. Um, it affects millions of people worldwide. There's, there's a rising incidence. Onset can be at a very young age um, or young adulthood. Um, you have frequent relapses when you've got this disease. Frequently you need hospitalization or surgery to treat. Um, and in general, I think the quality of life of, of individuals that have IBD um, is, is greatly impaired. And so we want to understand what's happening in this disease. So when we think about it, we know that there's a genetic component, and so a lot of work has been done, um, much of it actually at the Broad Institute, looking at um, genetic risk variants that contribute to IBD. Um, we also know there are environmental factors that, that can affect um, IBD, and, and really the interplay between the gut microbial community, the intestinal epithelial cells, and the immune system is, is what's, um, what's changing in this disease. So, so we want to understand now, how do we go from, understand, from looking at what bacteria are present to actually getting some function of, of what those bacteria are doing. Um, and I'll, I'll ask three main questions that I'll come back to throughout the talk where I'll give you some examples of what we're doing to, to address them. Um, so, so the first question I kind of alluded to already is, is are bacterial strains um, different in disease versus healthy samples, um, even for the same species I'm talking about now? Um, are, are there genes that are differentially expressed in health or disease? Um, and, and are there microbial metabolites that are altering host, um, either immune cell or epithelial cell function in the gut? And so the, uh, the first question um, uh, we looked at using this particular study, the longitudinal stool study. So this is one of the, the first cohorts we had where we had samples. Um, each row here is an individual that was tracked um, either healthy in green or, or with IBD in the other colors. Um, we got samples monthly from these individuals um, and performed whole metagenome sequencing on all of the samples. Um, the cohort had patients that were adults as well as, as kids, um, and we used a validation cohort that had already been published to, to validate what we were observing. And so, so with these data, we were able to look at um, different species that were increased in inflammatory bowel disease or decreased in disease. Um, Brantley Hall, who was the postdoc working on this project, um, was staring at this and, and realized that one of the main things that's different here is the arrow tolerance of, of these microbes. So all of the species that were decreased in IBD are very strict obligate um, aerobes. Whereas the, the microbes that are increased in IBD tended to be facultative um, anaerobes. So, so this means that the facultative anaerobe means that they're able to, to still grow in the presence of oxygen, um, whereas the obligate anaerobes die. And, and so the hypothesis that, that we reached, and this was based on our study as well as others that, that had been previously done, was that an increased production of um, reactive oxygen species during inflammation in IBD may be contributing to the decrease of the obligate anaerobes and, and the replacement by these facultative um, anaerobes that could tolerate the reactive oxygen species better. And so what Brantley did is, 
is he manually curated a list of all of the, the species that were present in the samples um, and, and was able to, to uh, assign them either um, facultative anaerobe, strict anaerobe, et cetera. Um, this is a non-trivial thing. It's actually very hard to compile all of those data um, to, to do that because a lot of it has to be based on experimental work that's, that's been done. But what he saw was striking when he assigned um, the classification of facultative anaerobe to the, to the, um, to the microbes, he saw that uh, in inflammatory bowel disease, there was a much larger proportion of samples that had uh, these facultative anaerobes. There's almost none in the control samples in our study. He looked at the Healthy Human Microbiome Project samples. Almost no facultative um, anaerobes were present in those. And in this validation cohort that I mentioned, again, he saw the same pattern where, where um, in inflammatory bowel disease, there were many more microbes that, that were facultative anaerobes. Um, from the list that I showed you previously, you may have noticed there was one organism in our um, increased in IBD list that was not a facultative anaerobe based on um, published data. That was Ruminococcus navis. Um, but despite the fact that this is not a facultative anaerobe, this organism showed the same pattern of being increased in abundance in IBD. And so the question we had then is Ruminococcus navis more aerotolerant than we thought? Um, and so Ashley Garner in, in the Xavier lab did a very simple experiment where she looked at Ruminococcus navis, um, Eubacterium elegans, which is a very strict anaerobe, and E. coli, which is a facultative um, anaerobe. And, and basically, she took the, the cells, she grew them up in the anaerobic chamber, then she exposed them to oxygen for either one hour or three hours. Um, and with the strict anaerobe, you see that once you expose them to oxygen, even after just one hour, we get almost no viable cells um, after uh, that exposure. E. coli, we know, can grow both in the presence of oxygen or not. It grew fine um, even after the oxygen exposure. And Ruminococcus navis was somewhere in between. So here we saw that after even one hour of oxygen exposure, we lost very few um, microbes. So they weren't growing, but they also weren't dying. Um, and even after three hours of exposure, we still had half of the population that was viable. So we think that um, Ruminococcus navis is... Um, it's certainly an anaerobe, it's not facultative, but it can survive the oxygen um, presence much better than other um, strict anaerobes. And so we dug deeper on Ruminococcus navis to, to see if um, we could observe anything in, in the samples that we had. And so here I'm looking at just Ruminococcus navis abundance. Um, each row is an individual. Each column is a time point that they were sampled at. And these time points are colored by abundance of, of R. navis. So, so what you can see here is that we're observing transient blooms. So in a given individual, you'll have very, very low abundance of, of navis, and then you'll have a bloom. Um, and we saw this over and over again in different samples. We looked in the validation cohort that I mentioned. They had four time points there, and it was the same thing. So, so Ruminococcus navis was blooming in disease. If we had just um, a single time point, we would never detect this, and we actually hadn't detected it previously. If we had only 16S sequencing data, we wouldn't detect this because Ruminococcus navis is one of the microbes that is very hard to classify by 16S. So because we had metagenomic data, because we had longitudinal data, we were able to see that navis was, um, was peaking during disease. In some cases, we saw that peak corresponded with an increase in disease activity. So we wanted to dig deeper on our navis. We looked at all of the published genomes that, that were present. There were not that many of them. So we isolated more navis from stool samples from people that have IBD. We sequenced those genomes, um, and we could uh, determine all of the, the gene clusters from all of those genomes. That's called the pan genome. Um, and then we could map our samples to, to those genes. And, and so in dark blue is the presence of those genes. You could see that some genes are present in all of the Ruminococcus navis samples. So our core genes that I was, or our marker genes that I was mentioning um, that we use for classification would be uh, some of these that are present in all samples. Some genes are present in, 
in some samples but not in others. And we saw that when we, when we um, made a tree based on these, the presence or absence of these genes, we saw two clades that formed. And so um, we wanted to look at which samples were present in each of those clades. And so uh, using all of the, the data that we had from the, the LSS cohort, the validation cohort, healthy cohorts, we observed that in clade one, we always saw samples from both healthy individuals and individuals with, with IBD, but clade two only had um, samples that were from our IBD patients um, present in it. So um, we did not find any adult um, metagenomes that mapped in this, in this clade. And so we compared the genes that were present in clade two versus clade one, and there were 200 genes that, that appeared to be specific to this, um, this clade that was really enriched for IBD samples. Then we could go back and we could look, because we sequenced the genomes, we could look at what are these genes that are different. Um, and you could see that not all of those genes are present in every single um, sample here, but none of the genes are present in the healthy samples. So at the, at the top here in green, those are the healthy samples. None of these genes are present in them, and the genes are present um, in some of these samples. The genes were enriched in those that are um, responding to oxidative stress, those that are um, giving the microbe the ability to utilize mucus, um, genes for adherence you could see, as well as lots of um, genes involved in iron acquisition. So these are all factors actually that, that could contribute to how the microbe interacts with the host in the, in the gut. Um, okay, so, so here this, I'm wrapping up that story. Basically we, we've shown that there are different strains that are present in disease. We can even get at what genes are different in those strains, and now we can start to dig deeper into the functional um, relevance of, of those genes. Can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, so do you know if these come with the disease, or are these already there? So we, what is the reaction of our patient? Does it correlate with the data, a genetic risk for IBD? So I, I don't think that we have enough data to answer that question, but I will say that we have some of those individuals, we, we saw them over time. And, and one individual in particular had all clade one, clade one, clade one in every sample. They had a flare of IBD. And at that sample, we saw that the clade two came in. So I don't, based on that, I wouldn't say that it comes with IBD per se, but rather I think there's something with the environment when you're having an active flare. Um, okay, so, so the second um, thing I want to talk about is, is looking at um, gene expression in microbiome studies. And here I'll talk about uh, HMP2. So, so HMP1 was all healthy individuals. HMP2 is the second phase of the human microbiome project where we focused on disease. And, and the disease, um, like I said, that we were focusing on is inflammatory bowel disease. This is a longitudinal study. We, we sampled... Um, individuals biweekly for a year. Um, we got lots of different uh, data from these individuals, including host genome data, um, clinical data, genetics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, et cetera. But for the pilot study that I'm going to talk about, um, I'll focus on, on just the metagenomic um, shotgun sequencing data and metatranscriptomic sequencing data. So, so for the pilot cohort, we we aimed for getting at least one sample from all of the subjects. So um, here are all the, the individuals with Crohn's disease, our healthy controls here, and, and ulcerative colitis here. We have lo long time courses for a couple of individuals in each of these groups, and we have several shorter time courses um, as well that are represented. Open circles means that we have metagenomic sequencing data, and a filled circle means that we have matched metatranscriptomic sequencing data. And so when we get these data, um, actually processing the metagenomic and the metatranscriptomic data, once, once the data are generated, is very similar. So um, we can do some quality control. We can get rid of, of um, bad sequences. We can get rid of host DNA that, that may be contaminating our, our whole um, metagenome sequencing. 
And, and then we could use Metaflan to taxonomically profile the, the organisms in the samples. We can also do functional profiling of all of the genes present. In this case, we used um, Human2, which is another um, program available through the Huttenhauer Lab. Um, I'll give links to all of these later. Um, but Human2 allows you to look at gene families that are present, um, metapsych pathways that are present, as well as uh, GO categories. So you can um, start to look at the functions of the genes that are present in, in each sample. And then you can couple that with the metadata and clinical data that we have. So, so the first big overview here is just looking at DNA and RNA abundance um, for every species that we've seen. Looking at Now we're looking at pathways is, is what this plot is, but you get very similar results with, with other um, classifications. So, so looking at the pathways, you could see that in general, the, if you've got DNA um, for a given organism, you have similar abundance of RNA for that organism. Uh, the dots are colored based on the correlation. So if we look at one of the most highly correlated um, organisms, Parabacteroides meridae here, you can see that at the DNA level, so now each column is an individual, um, and the bars are showing pathway abundance um, for all of the pathways. So every color is just a different um, pathway that we're looking at. Um, but you can see that if you've got DNA present for, for an, a sample for Parabacteroides meridae, you, you see that there's also RNA. Um, for the most part. You see that some individuals don't have any organisms that, that with reads mapping to, to this uh, species, and, and those are blank here. But if we look at other organisms, so Dialister and Visis, for example, we saw that there was relatively equal abundance of DNA for these two organisms. If we were looking at the metagenomic data, we'd think they were present in, in the same abundance. Um, they were present in samples from people that have IBD or don't. But regardless of presence, there was almost no um, RNA for this organism. So even though this, this microbe was there, it's likely not doing anything. It may be dead. This is an oral microbe um, or a microbe that's been characterized as, as being found in the mouth previously. And so it's possible that it's just passing through. Um, based on the DNA abundances, though, we would never have seen that it was doing nothing. Now we could look at individual pathways. So, so what I'm showing you now is a specific pathway. This, is, this one just happens to be this arginine um, ornithine de novo biosynthesis pathway. Now each, each column, again, is an individual sample, but the bars represent the overall relative abundance of the pathway, and they're colored based on which species are contributing the pathway. So from the sequencing information based on the reference genomes that we have, we can, we can say that the, um, the reads are mapping to a given species. And, and so here, looking at the overall relative abundance of the pathway, you could see that at the DNA and RNA level, they look fairly similar. Um, if we want to compare the species, though, it's a little bit easier to visualize if you look at the pathway relative abundance. So now, each of those has been scaled to one, and you can see the colors are representing which microbes have this pathway. So in some cases, at the DNA level, you could see that there's very little of a given microbe that's contributing, and at the RNA level, you see a huge um, amount of the reads that we have are, are from a different organism. And, and the same goes here. Sometimes they look very similar as far as the DNA and the RNA, which microbes are contributing, and sometimes they're different. Um, so if we look at a single individual now um, for the same pathway, we could see that over time, this individual has two to three microbes that are contributing the pathway. They're colored in different colors here. Um, but at the RNA level, it's basically taken over by only one microbe. So the microbes appear to be sharing um, sharing their, their function. They can tell what other microbes are doing. In this case, they're probably secreting ornithine or, um, or arginine, I don't know, in this, in this pathway, and, and they can sense that. And so um, at any time, only one species is, um, is expressing these genes. Interestingly, it was never the same, or it wasn't the same species at different time points. So, so they're kind of taking turns. Okay, so, so we know that there are genes that are um, expressed differently 
um, relative to the DNA presence. We know uh, we've been looking at strains. I'm going to give you one last um, snippet where we're trying to understand now what are those microbes doing as far as the molecules that they make. Um, so, so in this, this example, you need to think about um, what's happening in the gut. So we have epithelial cells that are present. Um, the microbes are, are present um, in, in the lumen. There's an inner and an outer mucus layer that's produced by the host cells. The inner layer has no bacteria in it, and the outer layer is very rich in bacteria. Um, the mu mucus is essentially a, a protein that's decorated with a lot of different sugars. And, and some bacteria can actually break those sugars off and consume them. So it's a really nice environment for some organisms. And there's molecules that are present there that are produced either by the bacteria, some are produced by the host, some are coming from food that we eat. There's a lot of different um, molecules present in the environment. So we know that in IBD, the mucus layer is thinner. Um, and we hypothesize that identifying bacteria that can grow on mucin, so that can break down those sugars and, and consume them, um, might, might enable us to identify commensals that, that are important for, for gut homeostasis. And so we looked at, um, here's the mucin peptide. Here are all the different sugars um, in different shapes. Shown here, we, we made a list of genes that were responsible for cleaving these sugars um, off, of, off of the mucin. And we also made a list of genes that were um, responsible for taking those sugars up. So they need to be transported inside the cell for them to be used. We then looked for those genes in healthy individuals. So we used the Human Microbiome um, Project 1 data, data set here. Um, and we saw that, that bacteria that had these genes tended to come from um, Bacteroidales or Clostridiales members. So these are the order of the organisms that um, were mainly able to, to do this function. So then we tested, so we had a bunch of isolates in the lab. We tested their ability to actually grow on mucin, and we saw that more than half of the microbes we predicted would be able to grow on mucin actually were able to grow on, on minimal mucin medium in the lab. And so then we wanted to know, are these mucus-utilizing species beneficial to the host? To make a very long story short, we did a mouse experiment um, where we gavaged mice with some of these, benef or these bacteria that could grow on mucin. We induced epithelial cell injury using this DSS model, and, and we monitored weight loss. And what we saw is that the, so the bacteria that were gavaged that were able to, to utilize mucin, one of them, Peptostreptococcus brucelli, was, was very protective in this model. So the mice didn't lose weight, um, and it did even better, actually, than Acromantia mucinophila, which was our positive control of an organism that's known to um, be able to grow on mucin that, it, that has beneficial properties. We also looked at expression of um, MUC2, which is the gene uh, necessary for, for mucus production. Um, and we saw that in, in those same mice, the, there was an increase in expression of MUC2 when, when the mice were treated with P. Ruselli. And so we wanted to know what, what could be mediating this protection um, and if other Peptostreptococcus species were also beneficial. And again, to make a long story short, um, we, we looked at genomes. We genome scanned um, many different Peptostreptococcus um, species genomes. We, we honed in on, on this particular cluster, the phenylactate dehyd dehydratase gene cluster, that has genes that are involved in tryptophan metabolism. And these had been previously shown in another species to um, be responsible for making indolpropionic acid, which was a, a beneficial molecule. Um, so some of these species have the full cluster, and, and one of them, P. stomatis, did not have the full cluster, so we predicted it would not be able to make these molecules. And when we used mass spec to, um, to search for the molecules, we saw that indeed in culture, P. Roselli and P. anaerobius um, were able to make um, these two tryptophan metabolites, indolpropionic acid and indolacrylic acid, um, whereas P. stomatis was not. 
And uh, a third metabolite that's a phenylalanine metabolite, which should not be affected by this cluster, was produced by all three strains. And so now we wanted to see what are these molecules doing. And we set up a system that's kind of a reductionist uh, version of, of the gut. So here we've got epithelial cells in, in these organoids. These are differentiated cells where we've got um, stem cells and cells that can produce mucus, which are these goblet cells, as well as other epithelial cells. Um, and we co-culture them with immune cells, uh, which allow us to monitor an inflammation level. And so in this co-culture um, system, we can add our molecules that we're interested in, and we can measure um, so that, that's what they actually look like. You could see the, um, the macrophages here and the organoid here with epithelial cells. And we can measure um, MUC2 expression again. So this, this is a, a, um, tells us if the mucus is being made. It's a goblet cell marker. Um, you could see that when we treat the, the uh, organoids with indole acrylic acid, we see an increase in MUC2 expression. Um, we didn't observe the same thing with IPA or, or our controls. Then when we looked at cytokine production, the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10 was induced in the presence of endolacrylic acid as well. So this is really nice. This, this means that the molecule we're looking at protects against um, DSS-induced colitis. It causes the cells to make more mucus and, and um, stimulates the production of anti-inflammatory cytokines. And so we wanted to know if this was relevant in human cells. Um, so we looked at human PBMCs, and we, we performed RNA-seq on cells that were treated with endolacrylic acid or DMSO. And, and there were a couple of categories of genes that were altered. So we saw a huge decrease in genes. These are now host genes um, involved in oxidative stress and inflammation. And we saw an increase in genes um, many of them regulated by the NRF2 pathway that, that protect against oxidative damage. And so we saw this. We said, hey, let's, let's look at a NRF2 reporter so to directly see if there's a difference um, in expression of the reporter. And we saw that with indolacrylic acid, there was a difference. Is there a question? Indolacrylic acid. Um, and so now we wanted to look in disease. Um, could we could we see the the genes that we now think are important for this um, this phenomenon in in our metagenomic samples from people with disease? So we looked at a cohort of IBD patients. We had stool metagenomic um, data, and we looked for the genes involved in mucus utilization. So um, the ones that are responsible for cleaving the sugars off of mucus and transporting them. Now, once again, we're back in bacteria. Um, what we saw is that IBD patients had a reduced um, capacity to cleave mucin. There were fewer of these uh, fucosidases and, and sialidases that, um, that are able to, to cleave those sugars off. So um, the organisms that are necessary to, um, to, to eat the mucus are not as present in IBD. We also looked for the, the FLD gene cluster, which is the one responsible for producing the indolacrylic acid that I was talking about. And we saw that patients had less, um, less capacity to metabolize tryptophan into these molecules. Um, there were fewer uh, samples that were positive for this gene cluster in, in the um, individuals with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And so the big take-home points that I want to leave you with is that um, we're looking at the microbiome in lots of different ways. Individual microbiomes are unique and complex between individuals. Um, there are differences in the strains of a given uh, bacteria that are present, um, and these strains can actually have niche adaptation even within your mouth. Different parts of your mouth can have different strains of a given species. Um, there are differences in the strains that we observe in disease, so as we start to look more at the strain level, I think we're going to see more of this um, these differences come up, um, and, and we can start to now look at the functional potential, um, what genes are present in those strains versus not. Um, in addition, by looking at the metatranscriptomic data, we can look at functional activity instead of just functional potential, um, and we're starting to identify bacterially derived molecules that target pathways important in the gut, such as um, 
barrier function in epithelial cells and, and cytokine production. Um, and I just want to say there's a lot more to be learned. I, I think this field is really just at, at the, at the start and, and looking at what's going on in the microbiome in all of, um, in all of these different ways, I think will help us to better understand what, uh, this community is doing to contribute to health or disease. Um, I did say that, that I would talk about all of the, um, the programs that I mentioned. So the, these are just the ones that are, um, available through the Huttenhauer Labs Bio Bakery. You can uh, just Google Bio Bakery um, and, and find it. All of them are here, along with source code documentation, tutorials, et cetera. Um, all of the work was done in the labs of Romnick Xavier and Curtis Huttenhauer. Um, I tried to put references as I was talking. The, the references are here, and I'm, I'm just highlighting some of the key players um, in the different stories, but many people contributed to all of these projects. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank <laughs> you.